you kneel with me, we'll have a silent prayer. Amen. There's a spare seat at the front. some questions yesterday after class finished there was some confusion quite I think quite a lot of confusion regarding what we did with the plowing time of the nethonyms um, particularly when we spoke of um, Michael Moore um, the formalization of their message and going back to 2004 so we do want to repeat that a bit more slowly, a bit more metho methodically. But I want to build back up to that. I want us to go back over our lines. And then later on in our class, we'll come back to that. We've done the line of the 144,000. We did priests and Levites. I erased the line of the Nethanims because of all that we'd attached to it with Michael Moore, etc. I wanted to start again on their line. My sister. Where is the Sunday law on the line of the one on, of the Nethanims? that it's the middle way mark and if you were to go back to the model of agriculture what begins here the ladder rain and at the Sunday law begins the ladder rain what else begins at the Sunday law going back to Millerite history what's this Boston. What begins at Boston? It's an unsealing of whose message? Samuel Snow. So what begins here? How is that message when it's first given? Silent. And then? Begins to swell. So the Sunday law begins the swelling that's going to develop into the loud cry. So that's just some revision. We can identify it because it's the middle way mark, but also the model of agriculture. Ploughing, early rain. Here begins the latter rain. 
it's going to, under the Sunday law, going to ripen the wheat for the harvest. So I've looked at our three groups, two for the church, the third for the world. We looked at our repeating pattern, particularly when it comes to the line of the priests. We filled that in most clearly. We looked at the messages that had opened up in each one of our four dispensations. We looked at the characteristics of that, where that message was focused to, focused forward, reflected light backwards. So I just want to add onto this a thought. This is, and this brings back to the worship our sister took uh, yesterday. Our sister took a worship yesterday and she laid out four reform lines. And what were those? What four reform lines did she take us to? We looked at ancient Israel. And modern Israel. How many reform lines for ancient Israel? And they are? History of Moses and? Modern Israel? Millerites and 144,000, 1798-1989. My sister in the black. We understand that this is the harvest of the first group. Yes? This is the harvest of the second. This is the harvest of the world. We're okay with that. Where would you place 34 AD on this reform line, on any of these reform lines? So where would you like to place it? What happens in 34 AD? And at the stoning of Stephen, what happens? Yes. As a... For the nation, also for that nation as an institution. Is that okay? Because it's the end of what time prophecy? 490 years. So where do you want to place it? 34 AD on these reform lines. Why? Why do you, would you want to place it here? So you want to place 34 AD because this is where the gospel goes to the world. And what's another word for world that we learn in Elder Paminder's class? Church. Church. Another, another word that we placed for the world. We listed quite a few in his class. Nethanyms. Gentiles. 
that's the one I was looking for. It's at this way, Mark, 34 AD, that the gospel goes to the Gentiles. The gospel goes to the Gentiles in 34 AD, just as at Sunday law, the gospel goes to the world. Does that make sense? Everyone okay with that? So if this is 34 AD, what's this way, Mark? What happens here? This is 34 AD, the stoning of Stephen, the end of the 490 years. The gospel goes to the Gentiles. We'll read a quote for that and then we'll work our way backwards. Great Controversy 328.1 Great Controversy 328.1 The 70 weeks or 490 years especially allotted to the Jews ended as we have seen in AD 34. So there's been 490 years set apart for the church. Can we see that? 490 years for the church. It ends in AD 34. The Jewish Sanhedrin the nation seals its rejection of the gospel. It's closed its probation as an institution. What line gives us that? Acts 27, the institution. Ending at Sunday law, here at 34 AD, the nation sealed its rejection of the gospel by the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution of the followers of Christ. Then the message of salvation, no longer restricted to the chosen people, to the church, was given to the world. The disciples, forced by persecution to flee from Jerusalem, went everywhere preaching the word. Philip to Samaria. Peter to the centurion of Caesarea. And then she speaks about Paul. So it's not just Paul. In this history with the, with the, the beginning of, of a more intense persecution, they're scattered and the gospel goes to the world. So we can see clearly from this quote that it's first the church with the end of the 490 years in 34 AD it goes to the world. So if we're going to take this reform line, the reform line of Christ... End of ancient Israel, over end of modern Israel, most closely re resembling our own history, then we must see similar patterns. Yes, first the church and then the world. So we place that in 34 AD. So we know that everything prior to Sunday law, if you were to look at the New Testament, every story... Every history prior to Sunday law is telling us what? My sister. You. All of that history, everything that you would read in the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation that occurs before 34 AD is telling, is there to tell you what? What is it there to tell you? Sorry? The message to the church. So when we look at the end of the world and Adventism has no idea what happens before the Sunday law, they're looking for the Sunday law. What are they looking for? They're looking for 34 AD, thinking that when 34 AD comes, somehow modern Israel will spring into action and be ready. They don't realise that all of those stories they're reading, the parables, the entire ministry of John and Christ has everything to do with the church. Does that make sense? So from Matthew through the Gospels, even into Acts, it's all about how God is going to prepare his church, prepare people prior to the Sunday law prior to the gospel going to the world or the Gentiles. 
Is everyone okay with that? Do we have any questions or thoughts? So when we go into those books to the to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, into Acts, everything prior to 34 AD, what then becomes this way, Mark? This is when we go to the Levites. So my sister, how many times does God call people out of Israel? Twice. The first group is? In the time of Christ, rename those groups. First the disciples. And then the three thousand. The three thousand? What history are you going to now? Pentecost. So first of all, he's going to take his right hand, reform line. He's going to reach into Israel and drag out these disciples. He's going to train them and fit them up so that they can go back to the church at Pentecost. That's what you're saying, if I have you correctly. So you're marking this, the beginning of the harvest of the second group as Pentecost. This is where you said 3,000. Yeah. We can read about this in Acts of the Apostles 39.2 and I will paraphrase that, just pull a concept because some people become confused thinking that at Pentecost because they spoke in all these different languages that somehow it was given to the world. People had come from all of these different nations. And she clarifies that very neatly in Acts of the Apostles. She says they were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven. During the dispersion, the Jews had been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world. And in their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on this occasion in Jerusalem. So for that, that's for those people that become confused by the many languages, thinking that this is therefore many nationalities or many of the Gentiles that started to come in. This is still specifically those of the Jewish nation. But because they had been scattered and fled into exile, they had learned or picked up the languages of their, of their home, new home countries. They're still, they're still just exiled Jews. So we have two of our harvests and then our sister took us to the first group and she said these were the disciples, the first group called. So we'll go back to the beginning. If we were to turn to Great Controversy 369.1. We would read about the ministry of John. She talks about John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. The preachers laid the axe at the root of the tree and urged all to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Here she's, she's going to start... Um, She's comparing and contrasting this with another history. So she's speaking, she's saying like John the Baptist. She's referring to another history, but I'm picking up what she's saying about John. So the axe is laid to the root of the tree. What's the tree? The Jewish nation. So at the time of the end, the axe is laid to the root of the tree and the message is, is given, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. What does that strike you of? If you were a tree, what would that inspire in you? Fear? So she is talking about Millerite history here and we'll note that in a moment. 
but she's going back to the history of John the Baptist to speak about the early days of Millerite history. The end of this paragraph, it's a fairly long paragraph, but she says the Spirit of God rested upon them, the be- them being the preachers that she's comparing and contrasting to John the Baptist. The Spirit of God rested upon them and with hearts softened and subdued, they joined to sound the cry, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. And what message is that? First angel's message. And how does she describe this message? The Spirit of God rested upon them and with hearts softened and subdued they joined to sound the cry. So is there a cry at the time of the end? No? (coughs) What history is she speaking about? Question. Is there a cry here? (coughs) What way mark is this? End? Boston. What way mark is this? Boston, is there a cry here? Yes. There's a cry here and it's going to swell, yes? yes? The first angel's message, a cry that swells. They joined to sound the cry, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. So she's comparing and contrasting that early message of Millerite history with the work of John the Baptist and lining it up with the first angel's message. So we know that this first ministry is done by John. Again, all through this, all through her narrative of Millerite history, she keeps tying it back to the end of ancient Israel. She says, I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. John was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of Jesus. Those who rejected the testimony of John were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. So we mark their birth as the time of the end. We identify John as the first angel. Who's the second angel? Christ. Question. Where are they at the time of the end? Brother. At this way, Mark, at the time of the end, for the end of ancient Israel, you have the first angel end? The second angel. So you have both. John and Jesus. Do you not? They both exist there. Do you see Jesus for some time? No. When does the second angel arrive in that story? 27 AD. That is known as the baptism. Here you note his arrival on the scene. But you can place his existence from the time of the end. I want us to note that. She talks about those who rejected John were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. Early writings. 249.1 Early Writings 249.1 Those who rejected and opposed the light of the first angel's message lost the light of the second and could not be benefited by the power and glory which attended the message, Behold, the Bridegroom cometh. So what is she comparing and contrasting? She's told us the same thing. Those who were not benefited by the message of John, could they receive the message of Christ? Those who rejected the light of the first angel's message in Millerite history, could they be benefited by the midnight cry? No. No. So again, we're seeing that she compares and contrasts both these histories. So you have both John and Jesus at the time of the end. Then you have the work of John as his paving the way for the ministry of Christ. You have Christ arrive at this way mark at the baptism. Does he begin his work here? My sister, does Jesus begin his work here? 
When does he begin his work? Just looking for a quote. John 2 verse 4. John chapter 2 verse 4. This is the wedding at Cana. So Jesus has been baptised. And then what did he go through? After baptism, where did he go? Wilderness. wilderness. For 40 days. He comes out of the wilderness and attends the wedding at Cana. John 2 verse 4. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Has his work begun yet? Has his hour come? No. So even after the baptism, we mark his arrival here. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove, says this is my beloved son, but his ministry as a second angel, it hasn't yet formally begun. If we were to turn to Mark 1.14. Mark 1.14. It says, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So we're marking the end of John's work and the beginning of Christ's, yes? After John is put in prison, Jesus comes into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. We can take to that early writings 154.1. Just want to pick up the one sentence. When Jesus should establish himself as a teacher, John knew that he himself must die. So you have Mark 1.14. saying that after John was put in pre prison, Jesus comes into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And then we have in early writings, she says that John already knew this, that when Jesus was to begin his formal work, John must be step aside. In this case, he was imprisoned and then killed, martyred. So we have a clear differential point between the work of the first angel, John, and the beginning, formal beginning of the work of Christ. So, we have our history prior to the time of the end, prior to the birth of John and Jesus. And through that history, what is the later seen understanding of the nature of the kingdom of God? My sister, what is the later seen understanding in the history of ancient Israel about the nature of the kingdom of God what are the Pharisees expecting that kingdom to look like sorry I couldn't repeat the question this is the birth of John and Jesus this is the time of the end for that reform line, for the end of ancient Israel. 
Here John is born, Jesus is born. We have the end of ancient Israel. This is that reform line. What are they expecting the nature of Christ's kingdom to look like? Do you know what John is expecting? Because he's expecting the same thing the Pharisees are. <coughs> what was Judas hoping for? We discussed Judas this morning. Judas was part of that group because he thought there was going to be some type of benefit. What benefit did he think he would receive? Why do you think Judas wanted to follow a humble carpenter? Not just Judas, there are other disciples there. They wanted to sit on his right hand and on his left hand. Why did they want such a position? Yes. So you do know the answer. So what type of kingdom did they think it would be? Sorry? A temporal kingdom. So they were expecting to have this earthly kingdom that was going to overthrow the, the Romans and rule the known world. So what do you think Judas wanted? A high up position close to this new powerful king. And the other disciples weren't that far different. One wanted to sit on his right hand and on his left hand because they thought that seat would look like a throne. So that's what they're expecting. The Pharisees, the Israelite nation is expecting all the way up to the birth of John and Christ to the time of the end. Why are the disciples expecting that if they've been trained under John? My brother. Okay. Uh, the way John understood the nature of the kingdom... Uh, is the same same teachings that he gave to his disciples, and therefore uh, the disciples had uh, a false conception of the nature of Christ's kingdom. So even when Christ came, they did not understand his and uh, understand the nature of his kingdom. So John misunderstood it. Why did John misunderstand it? The teachings that he received from. The Jewish, the Jewish nation of the Pharisees, the way they teach us, then how they taught. That's part of the reason. There's another part. Why he particularly expected it. Does anyone know another reason? It's not just the Pharisees. Where else has he heard or been led to expect that? Does anyone have a thought on that? Desire of Ages 103.4 tells us, tells us of John's expectations. So DA 103.4. Desire of Ages 103.4. It says that John did not fully understand the nature of the Messiah's kingdom. He looked for Israel to be delivered from her national foes. But the coming of a king in righteousness and the establishment of Israel as a holy nation was the great object of his hope. So this is just the proof for what my sister said before about the expectation they had of this powerful earthly nation. Thus he believed would be accomplished the prophecy given at his birth. And she then takes us back to, you find it in the first chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 67. This is the prophecy given to his father, Zacharias. And she isn't going to take 
all of that prophecy, she's going to actually cut. She's going to take part of a sentence from this part, skip sentences, part of a sentence from this. She's going to dissect that prophecy and just pull out a few thoughts to make her point. To remember his holy covenant, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. So John the Baptist's father is given this prophecy in Luke 1 starting at the story starting in 67, 68 he starts to prophesy. Where do we find that first part to remember his holy covenant? Verse 72 where we're a few verses into the prophecy. Sorry, no, it'd be back to 71. And he's, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, verse 70, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. If you're a Jew, who's your enemy? Who is the hand of those who hate them? The Romans. To perform the mercies promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he sware to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. So Ellen White doesn't go through this whole prophecy. She just cuts and pastes the essential parts to make her point. That at the birth of John a prophecy was given that the purpose of this work would be the deliverance of God's people from the hands of their enemies that they can serve God without fear. When has that happened before in Israelite history? Raise your hand, my brother. At the time of Moses. The time of Moses? They were in the hands of their enemies, yes? Could they keep the Sabbath? No. Could they serve God without fear? No, they couldn't keep the Sabbath without fear. So they have an understanding that this, the history of Christ, this deliverance is going to look like the deliverance from Egypt. Egypt, they're in the hand of their enemies. The time of Christ, they're in the hand of their enemies, the Egyptians, the Romans. Both times they're serving God with fear. So John the Baptist, it's also embedded in the message he's given. What's his problem? What is their problem? What is this history to them? Raise your hand. This isn't success. They don't do the work here. He has to give them back to Babylon. If I was to say, I'm going to take this history and overlay it with this history. Alpha and Omega. This is we don't need to go to any story this is just a template that we use. What do you call this? Failure and success. Looking for another thought this is Brother Willie Alpha and Omega? This is where you are, yes? This is where you exist. This is your history. So this is? Natural? Another word for natural? Literal? And? Spiritual. So what does John the Baptist not know how to do? 
Brother Willie. He has a problem on how he moves from the eater to the spirit. The Pharisees have that problem. John has that problem. Yes. The rules of parable teaching, taking the literal to the spiritual. He's had that since his birth. And this prophecy that he's given at his birth, does that help him at all? No. Instead, it, it perpetuates the same misunderstanding. So the Pharisees have this misunderstanding. It's embedded in the work of John. It's the center of John's hopes and dreams. Then comes Christ at the baptism. So John doesn't understand what the quote just told us. John does not understand the nature of the kingdom, yes? He doesn't understand that. John represents the first angel. Then comes the second angel. Christ. Does Christ understand the nature of the kingdom? Yes. yes. What does he need to reteach his disciples? If you were to go to Matthew 13, Matthew 13, 10 and 11. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, the disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them is, it is not given. So in his parables, what is he trying to teach them of? He's trying to teach them the nature of of the kingdom. So if we were to go through this chapter from verse 24 Matthew 13 24 Another parable put he forth unto them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a man. So Jesus He's going to take these misinformed disciples, these people who have been trained under the Pharisees, then trained under John, that they have a certain perspective of the nature of the kingdom. He's going to take all of those people and then for everyone that will listen, that has ears to hear, he's going to say the kingdom equals... 24, kingdom equals a man. Do we have any others that you can think of? This is the man who sows. Raise your hand if you want to add another one. The kingdom of heaven is like 10 virgins. Any others? A brother? A net. Brother? Sorry? Mustard seed. My sister? Sorry? Leaven. My brother? Treasure. Treasure. We know that we're referring to whole parables here, not specific words. Anyone else? My sister. Yes. Sorry? Yes. What did you say? Pearls. Pearl. Sorry? I'm sorry. A pearl. A householder. a householder. 
What do you think Jesus is trying to get through to them? We've got most of them that I have listed. We could include a king, a certain king, that parable. So we have we have time and time again, parable after parable, and what is Christ desperately trying to get through to them if they have ears to hear? The nature of the kingdom. I was trying to answer what Christ wanted to get rid of, the wrong understanding of the nature of the kingdom. So they have a perspective, the Pharisees have their perspective of what the kingdom looks like. It's perpetuated by John. He teaches, he takes this first group, the disciples, which we line up with the priests, and he teaches them a true message, but incorporated, encapsulated around the same misunderstandings held by the Pharisees. He does his work. The work of the second angel begins in earnest. And what does he do? What does Christ do? He employs his parable teaching. And then in parable after parable, where John did not understand the nature of the kingdom, therefore the disciples don't understand the nature of the kingdom, Jesus says the kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. And he lines it up in parable after parable, line after line, to try to... Help the disciples unlearn, unlearn their latest see and understanding. Did everyone unlearn of the twelve? Who refused to unlearn? Who held on to John's understanding of the kingdom? Judas. And when did he leave? Right before. The test, the major test for those 12 disciples, you find Judas leave. What was Judas holding on to? A misunderstanding of the nature of the kingdom. He was holding on to what he had heard taught by who? The first angel's messenger. So at the very beginning, I asked my sister where to place 34 AD. We see in the reform line of Christ, in this one that is most closely resembling or representing our own time, the history of success that was the end of ancient Israel, that takes us to the history of success that is the end of modern Israel. We take these two. This history of the 144,000 in the end of modern Israel comes with these three calls, two to the church, one to the world. So when we go back to the history of Christ, we find two calls for the church, one call out for the world. The Gentiles begin in 34 AD. The second call to the church begins at Pentecost. The first call was the disciples that had existed throughout this history and are tested at the cross. We can all see that, the three groups. So when Elder Jeff comes and he says that the person that he is to pass the mantle to, he's going to find another leader and pass the mantle and he places that at Panium, what is his problem? Because that's what he now teaches. He teaches that he is the first. He can see every reform line. Moses, Joshua, Miller Snow, that there's two of them. There's these two messengers. And he says he's going to pass the mantle to the second at Panium. My sister, what's his problem with that? Going back to the line of Christ. Yes. Elder Jeff now teaches that there is a second leader. He can see that because of Miller and Snow, Moses, Joshua. And he says that the time for him to pass that mantle to another leader, probably he's expecting around the time of Panium. Why can't it be Panium? 
Because the line, the line teaches us that. Which the line? line the line of Christ? Where is Panium on the line of Christ? Pentecost. Pentecost. Who are our two leaders? Hmm? Who are our two leaders in the history of Christ? John and Christ. John and Christ. Where was Jesus at Pentecost? He's up in heaven, isn't he? Doing a different ministry. So if he's going to pass the mantle here, John has long died. Jesus is doing the work of mediating in heaven. This is just one example. Where the reform lines solidify our understanding of where we are as a movement. So going back. In application, we have a history prior to the time of the end. We have later seen understandings about the nature of the kingdom, yes? Elder Paminda taught, these, these histories, this line of Christ is there to teach us about our own condition. Is that correct? We all agree? So do we have misunderstandings about the nature of the kingdom? Do we have as much to unlearn as the Pharisees and John? So we have our own misunderstandings. The first angel, what's his problem? What's Elder Jeff's problem? Does he understand the nature of the kingdom? No, he cannot. So someone else must come and reteach them about what this kingdom looks like and what methodology does he use to do that? Parable teaching. It's all based on parables. Where John misunderstands the nature of the kingdom, Christ is going to reteach them by parable after parable after parable. Every time he says, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a householder, he's trying to change their misconceptions that they took from John. The disciple who refuses to unlearn, to take in these parables that holds on to this message of this deliverance from the Romans and this earthly kingdom is Judas. And he decides that because the second angel is not doing his job properly, he's going to take the power into his own hands and go to the Jewish leadership and force, try and force that movement to look like how he was taught to believe it should look. And that was the betrayal of Christ. So when we come to our own time, we know that the work under the second leadership is represented as a leadership that must reteach misconceptions all based on the rules of parable teaching. Early Writings 299.2 With trembling, William Miller began to unfold to the people the mysteries of the kingdom of God, carrying his hearers down through the prophecies to the second advent of Christ. With every effort he gained strength. As John the Baptist heralded the first advent of Jesus and prepared the way for his coming, so William Miller and those who joined with him proclaimed the second advent of the Son of God. the time of the end you see the rising up of John the Baptist she compares and contrasts him with the rising up of William Miller when is the testing for the first group in the history of the Millerites when are they tested my sister April 19 where do you place April 19 on our reform lines? Here? <coughs> it's 9-11 a test. I agree. When I say test, I'm looking for a shut door, a harvest. When is the harvest for the first group in the history of the Millerites? The harvest like you asked when were they first 
Looking for their harvest. Where would you place that? On the first group. From which group is it? What parable are they living out? What parable are the Millerites living? Matthew 25. So in that parable you have two groups, yes? Five wise and five foolish. They're going to come to a shut door. You have five wise and five foolish. They've gone through this history. When is the shut door for them? October 22nd. So they know they're living out the parable of the ten virgins. And they go through different experiences. They go through April 19. And what is April 19 in this parable? April 19 in the parable of the ten virgins. What do they identify as April 19? I was asking my sister. Tarrying time. So you can see April 19 is built into that parable, but it's not their shut door. It's still test testing. Once they see the bridegroom tarry, what do they all do? They all go to sleep. Are they all making sure they ha that they're prepared with oil? No. So that they're already being challenged here. And then you come to July 21st, midnight, midway, and there is a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And then we have the five wise go in, the five wise locked out, and the shut door. So we see April 19 built into that parable. But I was looking for October 22, the shut door. So for the first group, where's the shut door? October 22. So by October 22, 1844, you have the work of Miller and then Samuel Snow. And where do you want to place him on this line? From April 19? I mean to October. To October 22. What is Samuel Snow doing here in April? Well, when he had his appointment, repeat your question. You said that we would place Samuel Snow beginning in April 19. It's from that, that dispensation, from April 19. What is Samuel Snow doing in the history of April 19? That he came up with an idea of the Has the cry began? It begins. So has he really began his mission? No. No. Has Christ began his mission here? His work. Christ in the history of the end of ancient Israel, his baptism. No, he's there, but he hasn't formally begun his work. So Samuel Snow, he exists here, doesn't he? He's writing letters, isn't he? But he hasn't formally begun his work. We know that we have the history of Samuel Snow's letters. He is speaking in that history, but it hasn't formally begun. It formally begins at July 21st, and we place July 21. This is Miller and Snow. The transition from the first to the second, July 21st being midnight or midway 2014, midnight, midway Sunday law. They're all characteristics or symbols of the same way mark. 
Are we okay with that? Any thoughts or questions so far? My brother. Okay. So when you look at the beginning of the work of Christ, Christ begins to work in Jerusalem at Passover, and then uh, maybe a few days or few times begin to like go with Jesus, and then you move from Jerusalem then to Galilee. So I'm not sure what I'm asking. Are you marking the transition between John Baptist or the what uh, actual work of Christ? What happens when John the Baptist stops speaking? Christ already continued working, but he moved from Jerusalem then to Galilee. John the Baptist knew that before Christ must be properly begin his mission, he would die. Correct? So I don't quite understand your problem. <coughs> okay, my problem with that, not a problem actually, but it's like uh, to confirm the beginning point whereby I try to give actual work whereby the beginning point of his work. What happened in 2014? In this movement, what happened in happened before 2014 my brother separation. sorry separation. separation the first major shaking of this movement yes Christ begin his ministry? What does he do? <coughs> he goes into the temple and he cleanses it. He starts kicking people out. So 2014, when we line up with the history of Christ, we see Jesus begin his ministry and he begins by cleansing the temple, yes? That's how he begins his ministry. 2014, what happens? The first cleansing of the movement. <coughs> that would be my answer. First temple cleansing. The same time transition from John imprisoned and killed so Christ can begin his work. And Ellen White identifies that transition. It's not just a transition we are aware of. It was a transition John expected in advance. So we've gone through the history of Christ, seeing the transition from the first angel to the second angel. The first has misconceptions. The second is going to uh, help those who have ears to hear and learn them through the methodology of parable teaching. I just wanted to touch on Millerite history so we could go back and see the same thing. Parable of the ten virgins. All of that history leading them to the shut door of October 22. The five wise and the five foolish. Our second witness that we are correct to say that there was a transition of leadership of this movement in 2014. 2014 lining up directly in its primary application with July 21st in the Boston camp meeting. So we have two solid witnesses just in that time alone that 2014 was the point where there is a transition of leadership and that new leadership must work through parable teaching.
these quotes aren't directly helpful to our study, but I'm going to write them down because I think they become extremely relevant for us. Early writings to 60.1. Review and Herald, April 11. Eighteen ninety three, paragraph seven. <coughs> By the way, when we go to eighteen ninety three, what's the first thing we should think of? Sorry, my brother, shout it. Eighteen ninety three, brother Willie. It's not in 1893, my brother. Sorry? Chicago World Fair. My brother? Why is that relevant to us so now? I think the why have we looked in the last two years at 1893? My sister, October. 3, 2018, we went to 1893 to prove what? October 3, 2018, we went to 1893 To prove what? Not sure? My sister. Sunday law? You're accurate. There is... Chicago World Fair, one, um, one of our brethren took us to, trying to push through a Sunday law. Why are we discussing that in October of 2018? Why did that become relevant to the Midnight Cry message? Joy, Sister Joy. I think the histories of the midway could uh, take us from 1893 to 2019, but it's, it's not 1893, it's 1892. 1893, what two numbers do we use? 2012, how is 2014 predicted? 2012, please don't whisper answers. 2012, how is 2014 predicted? Using the From? 1888. 1888. So why did we use 1893? Use the 126. The 126 to take us to? 2019. 2019. And we specifically looked at the Chicago welfare. One of our brothers said that A.T. Jones gives us three dates. What are those three dates? Do you know? 1863, 1888, 1893. So third of our three dates. 
We know it's a 126 tenth of a 1260 to take us to 2019. So when we see something written April 11 of 1893, we should pay attention to that, yes? 2019 on the line of Christ, what is it? The cross. She says there is less excuse in our day for stubbornness and unbelief than there was for the Jews in the days of Christ. They did not have before them the example of a nation that had suffered retribution of their unbelief and disobedience. So what is she saying? In the history of Christ, the Israelites ha had less of an excuse. Why? Because they didn't have a parable history to compare themselves to. But we have before us the history of the chosen people of God. We have all the history of ancient Israel. Now we don't just have ancient Israel. Now we have the history of the Millerites who separated themselves from him and rejected the Prince of Life. Though they could not convict him of sin, yet they could not fail to see their own hypocrisy. They hated the Prince of Life because he laid bare their evil ways. In our day, Greater light and greater evidence is given. We have also their example. We have their history as a parable. The warnings and reproofs that were presented to them, to Moses, to the Jewish nation, to the Millerites, we have. And our sin and the results of our sin, the punishment for our sin will be greater if we refuse to walk in the light. Many said, if only I had lived in the days of Christ, if only I had lived in the history of the Mil Millerites, I would not have twisted his words or falsely inter interpreted his instructions. I would not have rejected the 2520, the 2300 days, the 1260. I would not have rejected and crucified Jesus as did the Jews. But that will be proved by the way in which you deal with the message and his messengers today. Apply that to 2019. How many people in the movement are saying we wouldn't have crucified Christ? We would have been faithful Millerites. We would have accepted Miller and Samuel Snow, John the Baptist. We would have accepted the nature of his kingdom. We wouldn't have rejected it like Judas. We would have understood. That will be tested by how people respond to the message and the messengers that God was using in 2018 and 2019. The Lord is testing the people today, 2019, as much as he tested the Jews in their day. When he sends his messages of mercy, the light of his truth, he is sending the spirit of truth to you. And if you accept the message, you accept of Jesus. Those who declare that if they have lived in the days of Christ, they would not do as did the rejectors of his mercy will today, 2019, be tested. Those who live in this day are not accountable for the deeds of those who crucified the Son of God. But if with all of the light that shone upon his ancient people, delineated before us. What does delineated mean? To place on a line with all of the light of past histories placed on lines before us. We travel over the same ground they did, cherish the same spirit, refuse to receive the same reproof and warning, then our guilt will be that much greater and the condemnation that fell upon them will fall upon us. Only it will be as much greater as our light is greater in this age than was their light in their age. So we spoke about each dispensation increasing light. Ellen White is going to take that concept and expand it and she's going to take dispensations not within a reform line but increasing light in the history of Moses increases more through the history of Christ. She's saying Moses Christ beginning of ancient Israel End of ancient Israel. Beginning of modern Israel. 
for those of us that walk down in this history where you and I are, how much light do we have compared to Moses? Does anyone think we have the same? Why is so much more expected of us? Our guilt will be that much greater and the condemnation that fell upon them will fall upon us. Only it will be a greater condemnation for us in comparison to how much more our light is greater in our age than was their light in their ages. We have greater light than any other dispensation or reform line has ever had. So of course she's applying this in her original context into 1893. But we can take that for a 126 and put it into 2019. The 126 allows us to do that. And when we do that, we can see that the light that we had in the history of 2019, for all of those in the movement that said we would not have crucified Christ, rejected the message through parable teaching. We would not have rejected the 2,300 days. We would not have rejected Samuel Snow's message. When are they tested? A message is going to come that takes past history and delineates it, puts it on a line and shows two messages, equality and Sunday law. And just as she identifies those in her day who thought they would never crucify Christ but crucify him through the rejection of the 2,300 days, what did they do inside this movement? If they don't like the message of equality, what did they just do? Crucified Christ. Except how much greater is it to reject equality than to crucify Christ? They had more light inside this movement to accept equality than the Jews had to accept Christ. So the condemnation is greater for those who rejected the message of equality that came the last two years. A greater condemnation than for the Jewish nation. Do we have any questions or thoughts on that issue or subject? We haven't gone back to Michael Moore. I wanted, just while we had our reform lines up, to show how they are demonstrated in our past histories. We haven't gone back to Moses. Uh, we're not going to go back and do Moses and Joshua because I didn't want to spend more than one class on this. But we've gone back to the history of Christ primarily because that is the history of success most closely aligned with our own. We went back to the history of the Millerites and touched on that and we showed how both histories give us examples of our reform line, particularly this history of the end of ancient Israel, paralleling the end of modern Israel. The transition from the first angel to the second angel. The work of the second angel to, to reteach the disciples the movement, the misconceptions through the methodology of parable teaching. Judas, who would not be retaught that methodology. The first temple cleansing, transitioning from John to Jesus, the first from, from the second. The two from the time of the end, John and Christ. 1989. Who's raised up? When does Elder Parminder become Adventist? Both exist from the time of the end. Just as in the history of the end of ancient Israel. You're going to have the work of the first, the introduction of the second, but at the formal introduction of the second leadership, this methodology of parable teaching must be what is used 
to help us unlearn our later seen understandings of what the kingdom is meant to look like. It's only through parable teaching that can do that. And we didn't go to the quotes that talked about the disciples at Pentecost when she speaks about that as being a symbol of the early rain. She's doing a different line. She speaks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as being an understanding of parable teaching. So I wanted us to just see our reform lines back into the context of Christ's history the end of ancient Israel and um, the history of the Millerites, our, alpha, our own alpha history. When we come back tomorrow, we will touch on Michael Moore and review some of that. Um, but we also have Sister Snyder here and she, she has looked in some detail into Michael Moore. So we will review that, but we're going to cover him. Also, um, Sister Snyder will lead us through a worship one night and give us some of that history of Michael Moore, his documentaries, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, so we can be solidified in that understanding of what it means for the Nethanims to be ploughed. The understanding of what happens in the ploughing of the Nethanims, I think is more crucial to understanding their future than what we might realise. We'll review that tomorrow. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Father in heaven we know that people for so long desired to be part of this history and Lord we are grateful that we get to see these times when you have given more light more accumulated light from 6,000 years to this generation than ever before we have all of the parable histories of the time before us all delineated before us I pray Lord that none of us will will fall as did the Israelites, as did the Jewish nation, as did Judas, as did the Protestants in the time of the Millerites. May we not feel so secure. May we realise the, the solemnity of, of the messages that you give to us. May we treat them with the respect that they deserve. Lord, I pray that we will not be, be easily shaken from them. May we see the strength of this methodology, of these delineated histories. May we put our faith in them. I pray that you will continue to lead and guide your people and that each one of us will be faithful in this work. In Jesus' name, amen.